Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm returning to see a close friend of mine, Sandy of Jacklaw Knives and Wiltshire Man. Now if you've been following my channel for a while, you may recall that about five years ago, I visited Sandy here at his workshop in the city of Swindon in the county of Wiltshire in the west of England. It was a very special moment for me because in that visit, I spent a couple of days with Sandy where he built my own custom jackal knife that I cherish till today. And at that time we documented what he had going on in his workshop, his process, etc. Now fast forward five years, a lot has changed. He's expanded his workshop a lot more, the equipment that he uses, as well as his workflow. Now I'm visiting Sandy today to do two things. A, to do an update video, what you're going to see now in this video, uh, looking at his workspace and all the things that he has going on. And what we're then going to be doing is that we're actually going to go into a wild camp at a permission woodland Sandy has nearby. Now, if that video is out by the time you're watching this, because I don't know what order I'm going to put these out in, the link to that will be down below. So without further ado, let's get straight into this video where we're going to do an update on Sandy of Jack and Eyes and his workshop. Sandy, nice to see you again after so long. Nice to see you again, Zed. I bet it's nice to be out of lockdown now because you were Zed outdoors and then you were Zed indoors and now you're back outdoors again. It is, legally. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, it's been good to see you, man. How have you been keeping during the lockdown oh, over the past year? I think it's been a difficult time for a lot of people. Um, but for me, fortunately, I live on the edge of town. It hasn't affected me. Uh, my business has been buoyant throughout it. I haven't had to uh, take any of the furlough payments. In fact, I've had more interest over the last year than at any other time, I'd say. So yeah, a positive for, for me. Excellent. And in terms of your health and whatnot, how has that been keeping? Uh, health, again, fairly good. Uh, I'm getting a bit older, uh, but generally okay. I've got a bit of a problem with my eye at the moment, but it's not hindering me. I thought it was going to, but Thankfully it hasn't, you know, I've managed to uh, progress some not recent knife builds through to completion and I was very happy with the results. So uh, I can't say a negative really Zed, so yeah, I, I wouldn't mind growing younger rather than growing older, but uh, unfortunately it's a fact of nature, we all get older don't we? It is, yeah, I've got the grey hairs to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> well Sandy, I appreciate you allowing me to kind of document and update onto Jacklaw Knives itself, yeah. the workshop and obviously the range of knives we'll be looking at shortly. Um, but obviously you've expanded this since I last visited about five years ago. I think I'm, I had to as a matter of course. I wanted to streamline the business, I wanted to streamline my workflow. Uh, when I started the business off, I didn't have the knowledge and experience that I've got now. And uh, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it, so to speak. And so I had to um, put, put certain machinery in certain places and then have a workspace which enabled me to then to, to, uh, to work more productively. Uh, and that's why I've got the addition. But having said that, it's still a fairly compact workshop. Uh, and it's amazing what can be done with minimal tools, to be honest, Ed. And so starting off with this front section here, um, I'm not sure where you want to begin. Well, the first process doesn't actually start in here, it starts in there, but we can walk in there shortly. But this is my main heat treatment room, and it's, the lighting in here is subdued somewhat. I've got um, a window with a, which, is, which is facing north, and I've in intentionally blacked, bl blocked half the window out. Uh, I've got a cowl here which takes fumes away because this is where I quench the hot blades. Uh, in there is my quench tank. This is uh, full of quenching special um, oil which is designed to drop O1. I predominantly work in O1 tool steel. So that is designed to drop O1 at the correct rate for a fully hardening that type of steel. Uh, this is my main hardening kiln which is uh, an even heat uh, 18KO uh, and with this it can run up to temperatures which will allow me to use stainless steel at some point in the future. Uh, so it's well capable of uh, doing all the steels that I'm ever going to encounter. Um, interestingly for tempering of the, the knives you can do it in a standard oven. And this is my main tempering oven, and I find this to be an exceptionally good tempering oven. 
although I don't rely upon the thermocouple in the oven I've got uh, an external PID um, which controls the rate at which this turns on and off and there's two sensors two thermocouple sensors and uh, with that believe it or not with that simple old belling oven I can control my temperature and temperatures to plus or minus one degree centigrade wow. throughout a prolonged period of time uh, and I use that also for curing the resin in the uh, stabilized wood scales so yeah that's a great bit of kit even though it's very old and what we're looking at is this for supper, the pressure yeah. cooker? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you like, I can cook you something in that. <laughs> no, this is um, part of the stages that I run through for uh, stabilising my wood. Uh, if you pan over here, Zed, this is where it all starts. Uh, the wood gets, I, I get the wood in bulk, I can show you some of that in a minute. Uh, and then I, I cut them down to blocks, uh, for example. Yeah, so they'll be cut to blocks and then they'll be placed in this cabinet where they'll remain for a prolonged period of time to drive the moisture out of them. Uh, and I also use the cabinet for, uh, for drying my leather work because I wet form all my sheaves. So you can see a, a classic sheath there that's been wet formed and now it's, it's gone hard so that's ready to be finished. Uh, and so once the, the wood's dried to a certain level and when the wood's been dried to a certain level, I then cook it in the bedding oven again at around about 102 centigrade, and that drives out any last vestige of moisture. Uh, then I seal the wood blocks into a container and let them cool down. So they're sealed because you don't want them to absorb any moisture from the air. Although we can't see it, air contains moisture, and we don't want that getting back into the wood. So once the wood blocks have cooled down, they then go into this vacuum chamber here uh, and they're submerged under a, a resin, a thermosetting resin called uh, cactus juice of all things. There's a, there's a gallon tub of cactus juice. It's rather expensive stuff but it's very good. Uh, and then I go through a, a series of uh, applying a vacuum Minus, minus 30 inches of mercury or as close to and that draws all the air uh, out of the wood and I might go through three or four vacuum cycles uh, and then I'll leave the blocks in there for a, a few days and then once they've stopped absorbing any resin from there they then get put into the pressure pot and they're again submerged under the resin and I apply plus four bar and I'll leave them in there until I need them and sometimes they'll stay in there for a week or two or maybe even longer uh, these are now ready to come out and uh, yeah there's, there's still pressure in that one and then once they're out of there they go into the oven and they're hardened or the resin is cured uh, again and then they're cooked at around about 100 degrees centigrade and that then converts the resin from a, a liquid state to a solid state and you've got a stabilised uh, knife scale. And these particular bits of equipment, are they available in the UK or do you order these from abroad? Um, when I started knife making, uh, a, lot of this, a lot of this equipment wasn't available in the UK but I'm glad to say now you can purchase it in the UK. Um, there's a site online called House of Resin and House of Resin, they stock uh, the, the cactus juice and they stock the various vacuum chambers uh, so we're, we're catching up uh, the, the UK is becoming less of a third world country <laughs> 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 yeah um, so yeah they're becoming more available the kilns I had to import that from the States but now we've got some marvelous companies I, I deal a lot with uh, ground flat stock uh, and I find they're, they're a very progressive forward-thinking company and you can get lots of materials from them for knife making you can get the kilns from them G10 uh, specialized handle materials specialized steels so we are I, I'm, we are finding more choice available to UK knife makers now S 
So Sandy, we're in the second component of your workshop now. You are. I, I call this my engineering section. Uh, and you can see before you the main drill, drill presses that I use. I've had that one from the, from the very early days actually, when I uh, first started building my knives. Uh, a friend of mine wanted one of my knives and he gave me some money for it and with that money I invested it and bought this drill. I didn't have an awful lot of equipment at the time. And it's only a cheap pillar drill, it's made by Sealy. Uh, I think they're still available. Um, and uh, a knife, as a knife maker you can start off in, with fairly basic equipment. I mean, that drill would do everything I wanted it to do, uh, but it's time consuming if you've just got one drill because you've got to then keep swapping out and changing drill bits, etc., and drilling speeds as well. So, we have this one predominantly set up to drill pilot holes. Uh, this one is set up to run at a slower speed, and this I use for all the metal drilling, larger hole diameters. And this one is set to a different speed and this one I use predominantly for drilling all the handle materials, wood, which you want a faster speed for. This is uh, a very good value machine, quite a budget machine this but it's accurate. Um, this was my most expensive drill uh, but again not, not uh, hugely expensive, sort of four or five hundred pounds but it's very heavy duty and it's got a living action and it's very accurate. And uh, runs beautifully quiet as well. I love it. Very nice drill. Just a quick side note on a drill press. So I'm going to be buying a kind of, let's just say, a budget hobby style drill press yeah, for myself. Yeah. Um, what are a couple of things I should be looking out for when getting a drill press? Uh, I guess variable speeds. Well, they, they'll have that anyway, and they, they'll have the safety features. Um, you see, I haven't got a guard on that one, but I, when I do drill, I do wear a face mask anyway. Um, so you want safety features, good lighting, uh, and depending on the material, depth material you want, you want to be able to adjust it to give you the, the, the depth of material, the depth that you want, you know, so if you're drilling thick pieces of wood or whatever it is you're drilling, you're going to need to be able to move that to give you the the actual um, sort of size depth that you want. Uh, half inch chuck as well, these are all half inch chucks so I'm able to fit in fairly large diameter drills into that. Uh, some of the hobby, hobby drills come with little 3 8 inch chucks and I think they'll limit you somewhat. But then again if you're only going to be drilling small holes, well a hobby grade machine will do you. And so moving on from there you were talking about your mask. Yeah, very important. I really love this because without this I would struggle uh, to do what I'm doing. Um, it's a backpack mask so it, it, you can see the dust on it because with knife making with a lot of hobby, a lot of these sort of jobs you know that you're, you're creating a lot of dust and it's a very hazardous material um, in, in some cases carcinogenic. Um, the good thing with this mask is that it, it keeps your head cool, uh, it protects your face uh, and it feeds you clean filtered cool air. Um, it's it's uh, not cheap, uh, brand new, uh, around about £800 but what price do you put on your health you know and your eyes because this is a polycarbonate shield and so when I'm drilling if a piece of swarf was to shoot off and you know go into my face well, I'm not going to damage my eyesight or anything like that, you know, so I've got to look after my health. So I'd urge anyone thinking of getting into knife making or any other activity where you're going to be producing a lot of dust, dust your first um, purchase really ought to be some sort of PPE. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you also when we go into the next room uh, other things that I've got in place to try and reduce dust as well. And with the pack itself, is that powered into the mains or is it a battery? It's battery. Uh, like, I think it's a lithium, lithium ion battery and uh, it's rechargeable. It'll run all day and you've got a thing you can test it with so I've got three quarter power on it already. So yeah I would I would work a whole shift a whole day on, on that uh, and just push the button 
and it filters air for you. That's great, it's th made by 3M, it's called the VersaFlow. This is the TR300 and the, um, the helmet is the VersaFlow M100. Awesome. And then moving on from there at the back, what is that, a press? Yes, this is a 12 ton press. Uh, you can see I've written on there um, my recipe, which gives me a good impression uh, on, the, uh, on the knife blanks. And I find that um, 10 tons of pressure for 20 seconds gives me the impression that I want. Uh, there's a spare stamp. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, Zed, but you'll see that's made from Owen tall steel, hardened and tempered, and uh, you can it will leave a very nice impression in an old tall steel, uh, an impression which I hasten to have will last uh, indefinitely. And moving on from there, is that your vice? Yep, this is a knife maker's vice. I've got two actually. This one's made by uh, MP Custom Blades, Mike Palmer who uh, does some exceptional work. And this one here was a kind gift from uh, Rob Phillips. Uh, he made that when he was living in Australia. He's now living in London in the UK. And so uh, both these vices get used. Um, this one is very, very practical for me uh, because I can actually put blades in. If I want to work on the pommel, I can put a blade in that way and work on the pommel. This one, will enable you, because it's got a through tunnel effect, you can work on very, very long blades, even swords. So uh, they've both got their specific uses, really. And then moving on from there into the grinder. This is a fantastic uh, grinder. This is made, again, by Mike Palmer, and he calls it the Lancaster grinder. Uh, and you can see on the, uh, the the wall here, I've got a variety of different wheels. Uh, I've got different platens, so that's a slack belt, no, that's, a, no, that's the, the hard platen there. Uh, underneath the bench here, you can't see it, but I've got other bits and pieces and wheels and tall arms, uh, work rests. So for a variety of different uh, applications, I can swap tall arms and work rests out. Uh, and uh, it's just a fantastic grinder. Um, the big benefit with this grinder is its ability to flip. Um, so it, you need a good machine and uh, you need an accurate machine. This one runs very, very smoothly. I'll turn it on and let you have a look. You can just see the control because it's, it's, it's a three phase motor running off a single phase. This is an inverter and this, in, this controls and uh, feeds them the, amount of, the right amount of power. So I can increase the power or, or I can decrease it. And you can see that for doing very, very fine work. Well, I don't want to, want to remove a lot of steel. Maybe I'm just, uh, in this instance, I would have been using this for um, forming the finger toil area. Uh, and uh, I need to be able to grind very precisely and accurately. And so a fine belt running at a slow speed gives me that very fine control. And uh, yeah, I can't sing its praises. This is called the small wheel uh, holder. And again, I've got a variety of different wheels with different internal radii going right down to tiny up to that size. And then from that size onwards, I can transition up to these other larger wheels. So, a fantastic bit of kit built by a great guy. I uh, thoroughly recommend MP. Brilliant. And lastly, what have we got here? This is a metal cutting bandsaw. Not an expensive item, but every knife maker needs a metal cutting bandsaw. This enables me to fabricate my, or to, to build my own knives from pieces of steel. I don't, I don't outsource anything. I build the whole knife from a 500 mil uh, length of tall steel. I mark out with, with engineer's blue, then scribe around a pattern piece, and then I roughly cut it out on this bandsaw. Uh, and, um, it's a good machine, uh, very reliable. I've had this since almost day one, one of the first machines I, I bought, and I'm pretty sure that it'll probably go on for as long as I need it to. 
Excuse my ignorance with the bandsaw, but when you say a metal bandsaw, is it because the blades are different or because the bandsaw itself is designed? Um, to... Yeah, a bit of both really. You can cut wood with it, but for cutting metal you need a different blade and you need, and you need, and you need slower speeds. Uh, so this one will run a lot sl slower than a wood cutting bandsaw. And you'll, you'll hear and see that. So, That's running slowly. There's a, a tremendous amount of torque uh, in that blade. So you don't want to get flesh and bone anywhere close to it because that won't stop it. <laughs> um, it well, not with any saw, I should say. But uh, it's, that is predominantly designed for cutting steel, annealed steel. So Sandy, this is the extension that wasn't around when I visited that's right. you last. Yeah, that's right, Zed. Well, the first thing as your camera was pointing up at it, you know, when, when we were talking about the dust, I, I put this in. This um, filters the air, so when I'm grinding, I can run this, and it will uh, just cycle all the air and all, take out all the airborne dust. Uh, so that helps to uh, preserve one's lungs. And then alongside that, I had uh, John Lane, AKA Moleskin, very kindly installed uh, dust extraction for me. Uh, and my friend Noel, Noel Adams, very kindly uh, wired the workshop up. I got loads of electrical points and they were very kindly given to me by Stu. So uh, I've had some friends help me. Uh, when I set the business up and started things off. Like uh, anyone starting a new business, perhaps yeah, helping hand, come in handy sometimes, you know? So I was very grateful to, to have some assistance there. Uh, so yeah, um, that's, this is where I do most of, of the real dusty work. And, and unfortunately the dust, the dust does migrate throughout the whole workshop, but this is the, the most dustiest part of the place. Uh, and so, um, so maybe just starting here, what have we got here? This is um, a disc sander, 10 inch disc sander, or 12 inch I think, disc sander, made by record, it's in the industrial machine. Uh, I use it mostly for flattening off the very front uh, of the scales of the knives, so basically uh, it would be that front section there before I grind these beveled areas on. I use it also for um, you know, flattening off uh, if, I, if I'm going to start cutting the, the blocks you know maybe I'll um, I'll want to sand them to get them to get them at 90 degrees so I get them square so I know I'm working with a square piece of wood rather than anything which is a bit off and if you can keep things flat and square uh, that's half half the battle to be honest with you uh, and that's what that does next machine along the line is the wood cutting bandsaw uh, the wood cutting bandsaw remember I showed you the metal cutting bandsaw well this runs a lot faster oh, I've got to plug it in <laughs> <laughs> hold on a sec So the wood cutting bandsaw, a lot, lot faster. But again, it's really just a hobby grade machine. Uh, and again, I've had this bandsaw more or less since day one. I've done all my knife cutting. Uh, I don't tend to cut big, heavy lumber. It's, you know, this sort of stuff really is what I'm ripping down uh, and, and working with. But you don't, for, for knife making, you don't really need, it's nice to have the big professional heavy duty stuff, but at a pinch you can get it by with lighter duty uh, machinery, which is what this is, but it does the job. So if it works, why change it? You know, it does the job. Um, in the corner here, uh, this is a Cyclone dust extractor, which John installed for me. Um, I believe it used to belong to Ben Orford. 
Oh wow. Thanks Ben. <laughs> uh, ben obviously has got a much bigger workshop and a lot more uh, tools to extract dust from and I think it was that this wasn't big enough for his needs really. So uh, I've managed to uh, secure it. Um, and simply it's powered with this Clark uh, dust extractor and again John plumbed it all in for me so any heavy dust particles are caught in the cyclone and emptied out into that bin there and then mostly what comes out of the exhaust is just clean air or virtually clean air. Um, this is the area where I do all my on this this flat little table here, this is, this is where I glue all the, the liners to the scales on. Uh, just clamp them and glue the, glue the, the, the scales and liners on uh, together. This is the real negative to my workshop uh, because we'd all like a bigger space. But this is the only free worktop area that I've got. Uh, and to be honest with you, I could do with two or three times this uh, and I could do with it being in a clean environment because this is where I assemble all the knives. Uh, but the good thing is that although this is a very dusty part of the workshop, in a matter of a few minutes I can hoover this surface, I can run the air cleaner up there and I can make this almost into a clean room. So uh, and then able then to glue the knives up in a fairly clean environment really and, uh, and it does the job it works I use these clamps here uh, quite powerful clamps to make sure things are really compressed together sometimes I use levelless bolts and or Corby bolts sometimes plain pins and sometimes mosaic pins so that's that section um, these are knives in the making uh, that's one of my Bibby knives. Uh, that's been heat treated. I just need to uh, grind the bevels. Uh, this one's a three mil. And other knives. This is an old, the old small wasp. Someone re requested a small, uh, small uh, Mark One wasp that I'm building for them. Uh, but I did lengthen the handle. So more or less the same blade, but I just made it longer and I call that the Wasp XL. Again, that's hardened and tempered, just waiting for the bevels to be ground. Um, these two knives here are Hornets. So they're built as a pair for a, a good customer. These two knives here, these are actually finished now. They just want the, uh, the scales added and these have had uh, the tangs tapered so you can see that I've gone down from 4mm thickness down to just under 2 and that makes the knife a lot lighter in the hand uh, it's depending on your personal viewpoints it makes it more aesthetically pleasing as well and it's just another way to express the knife maker's craft uh, and that's two classics there so the next job for those will be to uh, put the scales on uh, this was a prototype, this is my own knife, I kept this for myself now. This is a, a prototype bibby knife that I made. And I find that just a, just a nice usable little knife, you know, uh, not too long. You don't necessarily need a long blade, but I, uh, I like that and that's my own knife. Put it on there. So they're moving backwards, Zed. These two grinders here have been the, the mainstay of, they've done the mainstay of all the hard work until I got the Lancaster grinder. Now the Lancaster grinder I use for all my metal work. These I use for all the handle shaping and all the wood shaping basically. Um, because it's such a dusty process, I've got the dust extraction close by so uh, I can try and remove the dust at source uh, as best as possible really uh, and I think that basically sums up the the workshop oh, of course we got a polishing mop as well there you go 
very old machine that, but uh, again, if it's working, why change it? Well, this is my current range of knives. They all start off, believe it or not, pretty much like that. So that's a piece of tall steel. And then I formed these pattern pieces. So I placed them on there, scribe around, mark the holes, and basically go through the process of grinding and shaping and cutting that out and then refining it until I end up with something which looks like that. Uh, so starting from left to right, this is the camp knife. I got one of these finished, so I can show you that in the house later on. Uh, it's just a bigger knife, longer blade, different blade profile, um, and it allows itself to perhaps a bit more heavier duty work. Um, next one up, I was approached by a few deer stalkers that wanted uh, a more slender blade, and so I come up with this design. This is quite a popular knife, it's a, called the Hunter Gatherer HG. Uh, and by the time it's built and it's maybe got a tapered tang, it's very light and nimble. It's generally got a higher grind on it as well, more of a sabre grind on it. Um, a lean, mean cutting machine. This is the standard classic, which is based quite closely to a woodlaw in handle dimensions. Um, the classic is a very popular knife for good reason, but the hand for anyone with small to medium or even medium to large hands, you'll get by with that. It's a comfortable knife. You can see it fits my hands, and they're quite they're quite large hands. It fits them a treat. But if you've got hands which are slightly la larger, that drop point can then rest in there and it can cause a lot of um, discomfort to someone with larger hands. So I did have a go at making an extra large version, but uh, I, I felt that it was too aesthetically unbalanced. So I wanted to keep the similar size knife, but I increased the handle length slightly and I also change the handle shape slightly to give a much more rounded uh, portion just here instead of there being a, a sharp drop point. So this enables someone with large hands to still, to still hold the knife comfortably even though it may, they may have larger hands and they can use that knife. So I called that the classic large. This is the Bibby knife, a personal favourite of my own. Um, it's more or less my own design, but having said that, the knife has been built in so many different permutations over the years, it's impossible to come up with a thoroughly unique and individual design. So uh, it's all knives now, whatever's been thought of has been thought of, you know, that old saying, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. So um, that applies really to all my knives. Uh, Next in the lineup is we're going on to the neck knives now. I call these NPPK neck packet neck pack pocket uh, knife NPPK. So you can they're supplied with a sheath. You can wear them around your neck, put it in your pocket, put it in your pack. That's the Hornet. Slightly longer handle to the next one down, which is the Wasp XL. The Wasp and the Wasp XL. The wasp came first and then I felt, well, some people would like a lo longer handle. Some people still prefer that, believe it or not. Um, but I felt the la longer handle gave it more purpose. And so uh, that's the wasp XL. And then the tiny wisp, which was inspired uh, when I wanted to build a flint striker. Um, and I had this piece of scrap steel left over. And um, someone said, why don't you call it the wisp? And I said, well, what, what do you mean by wisp? He said, uh, waste inspired sparking plate. <laughs> so originally, this was just designed as a curved back. So you could get a, a flint and some char cloth and strike like that to get yourself a spark. And I thought, well, why not make it dual purpose? And then make it into a knife and put a bevel on because you can still strike like that and then it's since 
evolved to have scales fitted as well, making it a proper little knife. And a very beautiful little knife it is too. Uh, and it's amazing what you can do with such a small blade because you've got infinite control. You can choke up on it and you've got very, very fine control for, for fine cutting tasks or scraping tasks, preparing birch bark for, for tinder, etc. Um, yeah, a lovely little knife. I thought I was going to drop it from the lineup, but it, it's, it survives and it's still much sought after by lots of people. And so I still make the tiny little wisp. Well, this is, uh, these, these are three knives that I've recently finished. Um, the first one here is very pretty. It's uh, a classic with lovely desert ironwood burl. Trinity mosaic pins. This one's got really thick G10 liners and a tapered tang. So if you look at the tang, you can see it tapers down from the full four mil stock down to just under two mil at the back. Uh, hand rubbed flats, about a 27 degree bevel on that. In direct comparison, if I show you this one side by side, this is uh, untapered. So you can see the full thickness of the tang right the way through to the pommel. This is a very, this is a heavier knife, not overly heavy, but heavier. And uh, a bit of a brute, to be honest with you, but it'll do the job. In the middle, this is a camp knife. This is the largest knife I do. All these two hand knives have, have stabilised scales. This one has uh, stabilised uh, maple. Trinity mosaics. Uh, it's got red G10 liners. And again a tapered tang. So it gives a very uh, pleasing look. And with the, uh, the Coke bottle shape it's very comfortable. This is a great knife for battening with, or any camp chore. Uh, and if you had to build, you could well you could build a camp with a camp knife. And these three are fully completed, then. Yeah, they're completed. The sheaves uh, for these are drying in the uh, drying cabinet I showed you earlier. This one's the sheaf is built for this one. Uh, I can go and show you that now. Well, this is the sheaf. I, my level work tends to be sort of fairly plain, uh, simple, but I'd like to think finished to a fairly high standard. Everything you see is hand done, stitching's hand done. I provide most of my knives with a dangler. So that's the basic sheaf. The sheaf has been wet formed as well, so what that means is that I've soaked the leather till it's very supple. And then uh, I've introduced a knife wrapped in cling film into the leather sheaf and I formed it around to make that shape and so that fits snugly to this knife. Uh, and the knife should fit in and it should have a nice satisfying click and uh, it won't fall out. So that's the complete package. Well, this is my dining room, everybody, uh, and we no longer eat here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the work has spilled over into the house space and I had to utilise the dining room as my leather work area. Uh, and so this is where I do all my leather sheaves and my danglers. Uh, and the leather, the sheaves start off with this very high grade uh, veg tan leather which I get from Paul Patrick he's a wonderful chap he runs a wonderful business in Birmingham and he sends me some very high grade leather it's not cheap but it is very high grade uh, and I won't use nothing else um, and so basically I'll, I've got templates again like I have for the knives I've got templates for the sheaves and uh, I basically cut the sheaves into templates like this and then um, go through the refining process and 
shape them, do what I've got to do to them until I end up with a finished product like that. And that's a welt which goes in between, in between there, you won't see it. And uh, on here I've got all the necessary chemicals, dyes, finishers, tools, uh, specialist hammers. This is a hammer that I use for knocking all the uh, stitching, stitching holes in with. Uh, there's a hammer that I use for dressing the leather. There's a very smooth face to it. Uh, in this tub here, if I can open it up, and my various uh, st what you call st stitching irons to form the stitch holes and what have you. And just the, the various basic tools that I need to do the job, basically. So there you have it, my friends. That's a wrap for this video. Sandy, thank you so much. Cheers, Ed. It's always welcome. You're always I, welcome here. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been, like I mentioned at the very beginning, it's literally been about five years. Yeah, yeah. Too long, really. It is. It, well, it, it is. would have been last year, wouldn't it, if it hadn't been for Yeah, because we did actually plan to meet up yeah, last yeah. year, but then, yeah. yeah, alas, the zombie apocalypse kicked in. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I really do appreciate you taking the time to show yeah, us yeah, around. Yeah. Once again, it was just a very relaxed, impromptu look. Um, a couple of things to mention, if you're not aware already, but Sandy has a dedicated channel to his knife making. That's what I do, uh, yeah. Jack Lord Knives is a very established channel. How, long, how many years have you been running that for? Oh, 2011, 2012. Oh, wow, that long. Yeah, yeah. 2000, yeah. 2011, I think it started. Uh, and it's been sort of going along fairly steady. I've got lots of tutorials on there. I've also shared a lot of my own learning processes because often there's an old saying, sometimes a good way to learn is to teach. Mm. So you understand the fundamentals first, then you then share that skill and that helps embed it in your own learning, if you know what I mean. And uh, to be honest with you, I've, I've, like anybody, probably made a lot of mistakes along the way. And some of those early films and videos that are still on the channel, some of those processes I'm no longer doing. I've, I've learnt better ways uh, to speed the processes up to give a better finish, to have a better product. So it's been a learning curve, you know. There's been some good times, there's been some bad times. And the times when you make mistakes, they're often very hard and painful. But when you look back, you realise that they're the times when you've really learnt the most. And that's how it's been for me, that's been my journey. But I get a lot of requests, people all around the world are trying to get their hands on one of my knives. I get around about 1,800 unique hits to the website every week. Uh, I build just a small handful of knives, sometimes only one or two completed knives a week. So do the maths. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to meet demand. Uh, and I've also, I, I, I've also got a lifestyle, the, I, the things that I do as well. I don't just make knives, it's, it's a passionate, business I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate to be doing what I'm doing I enjoy what I do but I do like to get out as well and also experience nature and t take my knives out and use them in bushcrafts uh, camps etc and just travel so um, I wish I could build everybody a knife <laughs> unfortunately I can't it's too laborious <laughs> I, I can't do it <laughs> so you can be lucky if you can get one but what I tend to do is when they're finished I try to drop a notification via my Instagram or on another social media and then I put them on the website and basically it's first come first served. Uh, they get snapped up really really quick. Sometimes they're gone in seconds. Uh, and I don't really know a better way to do it because selling online is not easy now. We've got certain laws we've got to fulfill. I've got to do age checks etc. So I've got to man the computer and do it all manually take the first emailer and then contact them and a little to and fro goes between us where I check their age, check where they live, take the payment, send the knife out, etc. So it's quite time consuming to be honest with you. Uh, and I haven't found a way of expediting that process. And sadly, I, neither have I found a way of expediting the build of the knives. Um, it is a very laborious process. And as I say, Zed, I've just got these hands. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I will say is, um, as a viewer as well of your channel, is that the one thing 
Sandy Azan on his Jack Law Knives YouTube channel. As you alluded to earlier, you've been very transparent about your own journey yeah, very and much, process. Yeah. Yeah. And I've lost count of the amount of knife makers I've met that I've credited you yeah. for helping them yeah. because of your channel. Because it's like <laughs> the lost arts, right? Yeah. Knife making is one of those things. Um, I'm not saying get the judgmental way, but a lot of knife makers are like keeping those secrets to themselves. Whereas Sandy, you were quite open. I'm very open. I'm yeah. happy to share all of my secrets. I, well, there aren't any really. Some of the processes. I've been fortunate enough for, for a few people to share some secrets, but they're not really secrets. And some of the biggest so-called secrets are what I've learned myself. When I've met with hurdles and obstacles in the manufacture of the knives, I found ways around that. And I've found my own answers, you know. Um, but I often get people say, you're a world-class knife maker, your knives are art and all this sort of thing. There's so many good knife makers out there. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself any better than anyone else. In fact, I look at some, I don't tend to, to look at other knife making channels very much, to be, to be honest with you. But when I do, I look at people starting off in knife building and I think in crikey. When I was at that level, I wasn't producing work anywhere like as good as what that is. So I'm sure there are many knife makers out there that are equally as good, if not better than myself. And uh, that's how it should be. But I am me. I do what I do. And I'm happy to do what I do. <laughs> that's it. I thought I'd rub it in by saying I'm, I'm honoured <laughs> to have a jackal knife myself. Yeah. So I'm part of the cool club. So <laughs> what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to do a few things below. I'm going to put a link to Sandy's Jack Lord Knives YouTube channel. I'm also going to put a link to his Wiltshire Man channel, which is documenting everything aside from knife making. Sandy has been very active for a very long time on both of those channels and continues to do so. So yeah. there is a wealth of information there if you're not following him there already. What I'm also going to do, I'm going to put a link to below to Sandy's website. You can find out more about yeah. his knives. Uh, a gallery of the collection of knives etc and finally what I'm going to do I'm going to put a link below to Sandy's Instagram profile. Sandy's very prolific on his Instagram so you can see things he's getting up to on a day-to-day week-by-week basis so links for all of those will be down below. Some I mentioned at the very beginning is we're now actually going to be heading off to a wild camp yeah, great. Um, locally so Sandy's got a permission woodland have, yeah. so we're going to do a very relaxed wild camp me and Sandy have wild camp before, but with other people, but we've never wank, uh, wild camped. No, just, no. Just the two, two of, of us. us. No. So yeah. not so romantic. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> He's going to sleep with a baseball bat tonight. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do? We're going to be heading off to that. So I'm not sure what order we're going to be putting these videos out in. But if you haven't seen that video already, I'll, I'll put a link to that also down below. So once again, guys, links to everything as described below. Sandy, once again, a huge thank you Cheers, Ed. for allowing me around the workshop with my camera so that yeah, everyone yeah. can see. That's okay. So guys, I look forward to seeing you in the next video with Sandy that we're where we're wild camping. Until then, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Sandy of Jackal Knives and myself, Sad Outdoors, peace out. Bye for now.